Galapagos Islands, a uniquely populated constellation of volcanic rubble hidden in the equatorial Pacific. Its infernal shores provide the world's only home for a dragon of the sea, a living fossil, the primeval marine iguana. Until now, his underwater life has been shrouded in mystery. An exotic remnant of the reptilian order, which ended more than a hundred million years ago, the sea dragon will now become the subject of search and study by Captain Cousteau, his divers and filmmakers, in the first full-scale attempt by man to probe the marine iguana's amphibious life. Calypso approaches the islands of Galapagos, 600 miles off Ecuador. Volcanic palisades rising 10,000 feet from the floor of the sea make for challenging passage. In 1835, Charles Darwin had come to the Galapagos. The island's unusual forms of life gave him the clues that led to his theory of evolution. Now we would explore the sunken Galapagos, and as divers, we will study the marine iguana, the reptile that returned to the sea long before man's attempt to do so today. Motorized underwater vehicles will be helpful in covering the vast areas below. Jean Clairion checks the regulator in his scooter. Air tanks are contained within the machines. Bernard Delamotte tests the motors and controls of his wet sub. With a speed of five miles per hour, the pilots will be able to fight the powerful forces of the Humboldt and El Nino currents, now in their seasonal conflict below. The fragile plexiglass nose of the wet sub is to be attached underwater, for the shock of being immersed with the heavy vehicle could cause it to burst. The scooters will follow the wet sub in this maiden voyage under Galapagos. Safety checked and synchronized, they're off. We use the wet sub and front propeller scooters together for the first time. We will fly between the forbidding peaks of the underwater volcanoes that rise before us for 3,000 miles around. 
Only the wet sub has controls for turns and for going up and down. The scooters are guided by the divers who merely aim them in the direction they wish to go. Calypso's divers circle a seamount and a sea turtle wins a race, going away. Another lap in the race is won by a leopard ray. The contest is joined by a 2,000 pound manta ray. The vertical walls of an underwater cliff are pockmarked for as far as one can see. Sea urchins with their rodent-like teeth have laboriously dug these holes in the solid lava. The vulnerable urchin undertakes this overwhelming task in order to gain shelter from predators in this barren underwater landscape. To collect this specimen, Bernard leaves his air supply and lets the sub float unattended. He has only a lung full of air and he must get back to his craft before the current carries it away. Motorized divers must be careful about descending too fast. Rapid pressure changes are harmful to the ears. Our divers follow a narrow passage downward. Ahead lies an incredible sight. Basaltic structures evoking columned cathedrals under the sea. Ancient ruins marine coliseums. Sunken Galapagos is a world that is still being formed. The islands comprise the largest active volcanic area on Earth today. When the island above was recently given fiery birth, the molten lava flowing into the cold water immediately solidified and piled up almost vertically to create this illusion of a sunken city. A city not built by man. And until this moment, and visited. Our motorized divers rise through a colony of curious young sea lions. Their effortless maneuverability and grace provide goals for the human diver. A marine iguana. Clinging motionless to the rocks, the iguana's protective coloration conceals him from the divers above. The invaders are gone. Now with its great prehensile claws, 
this prehistoric remnant of the reptilian age climbs out of the sea, very much as did his ancestors, millions of years before the emergence of man. On these wildest of islands, you meet the tamest beings. In the perilous jungle of the ocean depths, apprehension is the rule. But on land in the Galapagos, there is no need to fear. Many forms of life have evolved here, free from the pressures of predators. And they have grown amazingly confident and unafraid, having never learned fear. Although unaccustomed to man, the sea lions display an innocent trust in Bernard. Bernard's swim suddenly leads to an unexpected meeting. A marine iguana He has to surface to get his snorkel. Here is an opportunity to observe the iguana at close hand. The iguana is being watched by the sea lions, too. Their first objective is to tease him off his rock. The iguana tries to escape the playful sea lions, and it becomes a chase. The sea lions play with the iguana as cats play with a mouse. But the difference is, although they tease and torment him, it is only a game, and the iguana is never injured, unless it be his dignity. The sea lions try to prevent their reluctant playmate from reaching shore. The iguana presses on towards shore, but a relentless pursuer repeatedly pulls him back into the pool. The iguana begins to make slow but steady headway, gaining the shore inch by inch. Free at last. Home on the intertidal rocks of Galapagos. The reluctant dragon is free at last of his tormentors. Or is he?
The Calypso expedition team now plans to follow the marine iguana to its feeding grounds. In the Galapagos, food is the main problem. Young, half-starved goats, their ancestors brought here by buccaneers, have come down from the barren rocky cliffs to share this morning meal. Charming as they are, they do not belong here, and they endanger the islands. To local animals, they are unfair competition for the available supply of food. The divers are now ready to proceed with an offshore expedition to find and film the marine iguana, the only land animal to derive its sustenance exclusively from the sea. In the meantime, Joe the cook learned something about birds. In this hostile land where it's hard to make a living, this mocking bird uses an amazing intelligence to break an egg. The bird has figured out Newton's law of gravity, but not, unfortunately, how to keep his discovery a secret. The men have seen marine iguanas swim from shore to this point in the sea and then dive. A surprise from the sea, the fabled batfish. In the Galapagos, food is scarce for the waddling batfish too. It uses its piston-like fishing pole to attract its feed. It will eat anything it can attract toward that face. In search of an iguana eating, Delwa and Dorado approach an algae bed. The men are rewarded. Dorado moves in for closer observation as Delwa photographs for the first time the underwater foraging of the land animal. It is the struggle for existence, the winnowing process which determines survival, that has forced the iguana from the harsh barren volcanic islands into the cold ocean, which he does not like. He dives only to sustain his life. We observe he is never idle at sea, always actively feeding. He attacks his task with purpose, being highly selective of the algae he eats, knowing it from the rocks with sharp, tricuspid teeth as a dog knows on a bone. It is known that in captivity, the marine iguana lives only as long as it takes him to starve to death. Now we try to discover if the iguana will accept from man his own food in his own natural habitat. This remarkably independent creature that has outlived most mammalian and reptilian orders through millions of years of difficult survival would appear to want nothing from the hand of transient man. Upon their return from the sea, the chilled iguanas assume a basking position. Bodies turn toward the equatorial sun to intercept maximum solar radiation. 
Allier and Dalcouter come to observe the marine iguanas on their sea rocks, a few yards beyond high tide. Although all Galapagos animals live without fear, each has its well-defined territory the others must respect. A nesting booby's territory is as far as she can stretch her neck. The men, too, must respect territory. Vigorous nodding of his head is the iguana's territorial display. To show they come in peace, the men approach slowly at the iguana's level. But the iguana is wary, and in giving way, the booby's territory must be crossed once more. It was here that Darwin became convinced that species could change, and his experiences here as a young man led him in later years to formulate his ideas about evolution and natural selection. So these islands, in a very real sense, change the way man looks at the world. Captain Cousteau confers with Dr. George Bartholomew, leading authority on the marine iguana. We, on board Calypso, we have concentrated on the observation of the marine iguana. And uh, do we have any idea of where they come from, what their history is? Well, they are iguanas, and their closest relatives are in South America, but they do not occur in South America. Whether or not they evolved there, got to the Galapagos by chance, and then the parent stock became extinct, or whether or not they, some land iguana got to the Galapagos and then evolved into the marine iguana is forever unknown because there's no fossil record. However, these islands represent a microcosm of the, the continents, and each one is a little universe all to itself. And as a result, it's just a beautiful laboratory for studying behavior and ecology and adaptation. In some respects, it may be the best in the world for studying the adaptations of terrestrial vertebrates. Much is to be learned about this dragon that has turned back the evolutionary clock Bernard Delamotte leaves his wet sub on a lung full of air to pick up a mature male iguana for a physiological study. Iguana will get a free ride up to the Calypso, where Dr. Bartholomew and Captain Cousteau wait. Dr. Bartholomew will record and analyze variations in the iguana's heartbeat make sure these electrodes stay in tight, so I'll put this plastic strap around. The physiology of the marine iguana is of special interest to Captain Cousteau, since this animal represents a combination of characteristics common to all diving animals, including man. Before putting the iguana in the water, it will first establish his normal heartbeat. Dr. Bartholomew is concerned that these rare creatures are waning in numbers. Data on heating, cooling, and heart rate will aid studies on the iguana's adjustment to its ever-changing environment. Guy, the signals of the iguana are normal? Tout à l'heure normal. Oui. Dr. Bartholomew, uh, what strikes me here on the oscilloscope is that uh, at each heartbeat there are three peaks. Unlike mammals, the uh, lizards have three chambers to their heart, and we're seeing one beat from each chamber. One is stronger. The big one is the ventricle, and that's the one we'll use for counting. Now, the heart beats, uh, order, uh, 45 or 50, that's slower than the human heart. Qu quite a bit slower, but it's about right for this temperature. Do you think it's time to put the iguana in the water. It's a nice stable signal. 
Guy, vous pouvez demander à la plage arrière de mettre l'iguane à l'eau, s'il vous plaît. With great care, the iguana is passed to Jacques Dalcouter, who is to escort the animal to the floor of the sea. Dr. Bartholomew has already made laboratory cardiograms on iguanas immersed in a tank. Captain Cousteau and his divers provide the opportunity to further this study in the iguana's natural environment. As the iguana clings to a rock with his powerful clawed feet, Del Couture is to closely observe his behavior for the duration of the experiment. The iguana is now uh, underwater since 15 minutes. Now let's see what's happened to his heart. Yes. So one. one. Ventricular beat. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Another Two. one. That's eight seconds. Eight seconds. And then... Top. Seven. Seven seconds. Top. Another one now. Uh, eight, eight or nine per minute now, instead of 45. Go down from 45... 45 to, to about eight. eight. Mm -hmm. Why, it'll probably slow down to four or five. Four or five? Half beats per minute. When he does that, he shuts off the circulation to his muscles, and the blood just goes back and forth between the brain and the heart. I see. Sort of a heart-brain preparation. And the rest of the body is... The rest is... of the body is just cut off from the circulation. Wait a minute. His heart has stopped. The iguana can voluntarily stop his heart for up to three minutes with no apparent damage to his brain. Now, as his heart rate slowly accelerates, our pioneer swims up toward the warming sun. We are happy to return him to his home on the lava rocks. He has done his job well, this master diver. And now, freely, he may swim to shore. He's a creature unique, and much of his life still a riddle. In equatorial Galapagos, the sun rises hot and fast. By 11 a.m., it's 120 degrees. Intertidal rocks washed by the cold Humboldt current make it bearable for Bernard Delamotte and Jacques Delcouter, assigned to capture a male iguana for a special dive. Et voilà. The iguanas are lazily taking full morning sun to raise their body temperatures, which drop at night. The slumbering dragons are suddenly suspicious. Perhaps favorable trade winds have whispered the words, beware of Frenchmen bearing sacks. Lupe! Ça y est, je l'ai. N'aie pas peur, petit. We of the Calypso are also interested in these animals because we are studying ways to make man a better diver. A depth meter will help determine how deep an iguana can safely dive. Man's diving devices can still be perfected, but their improvement will be limited by physiology. 
In order to dive deeper, longer and better, it could be necessary to modify man's physiology. In any case, it is exciting to consider what happens in an animal that was not made for diving. Accompanied by man, the iguana is gently induced to dive, a dive he makes to his own physical limits. Twenty meters, sixty-six feet. Maybe he could go deeper. Unlike human divers, who must rely upon an air supply to their lungs, the iguana, when he dives, expels air from his lungs. Thus, he creates the negative buoyancy that will allow him to sink. The iguana tries to elude Cousteau's diver by hiding under a rock. Unlike fish, the iguana has no gills and cannot take oxygen from the water. He borrows oxygen from tissues of his body, which he must pay back when he returns to the surface and breathes there. No other land animal could survive this experiment. One of Darwin's sailors had forcibly held an iguana underwater to see how long he could live without oxygen. One hour. Now, its oxygen nearly depleted, this iguana is like the rock he rests on. He has dived to 28 meters, an incredible 90 feet. His chest concave from pressure, the iguana rises by activating only his flat swimming tail. Having mutated over millions of years from being exclusively a land animal, he's not a good swimmer. He's barely adequate in the water, which is now impatient to leave for the security of the sun-heated rocks where he will recover. After feeding in the sea, it takes hours for resting iguanas to repay the oxygen debt to their depleted bodies. Allier uses reflected sun to help raise more quickly the temperature of a chilled male, basking with friends. A few yards away, temperatures as well as tempers have already risen, for it's egg-laying season. A female digs her nest and must defend it as another female intrudes. Competition is keen for nesting places in the unyielding volcanic rock. The defender gives way, but she can't afford to give up. It soon becomes a pushing match. Horny heads locked in ritualized combat over possession of the nest. It's a tournament of dragons. The armored animals joust in an intimidation fight, but they do not put to use their claws and teeth. Like other endangered species, the animals do not bite or harm each other. Wounds inflicted could lead to the reduction of their numbers. Still, in the determined bout, not all holes are barred. As the battle continues undecided, enter the male, head of the harem, 
identified by his greater size and authority. The male appeals to tell them to stop fighting and lay their eggs. The intruder on the nest remains the eternal female and tries for the last word. And she gets it. The other female, the defender, returns to the cradle of her continuance. In this case, as in many others, it is the male who reigns supreme. In his survey of the Galapagos, Captain Cousteau visits a man who has established a very special relationship with the marine iguana. In 1935, Carl Angermeyer came to these islands from Germany. Most previous settlers had found them uninhabitable. Many died of thirst and hunger, or returned home. Angermeyer, like the iguanas he lives with, has endured. When Angermeyer, with his wife and mother-in-law, first settled on this shore, it was occupied only by marine iguanas. Rather than chase them off, he built a house amongst them, determined to become a friendly neighbor. In time, the iguanas grew to accept him, then moved in with him. Until today, there are 45 marine iguanas sharing his home. Do they go into your home? They go in the house, inside and on the chimney, everywhere. Do they have names? Well, uh, they have all called all Annie. Because Annie, Annie yes. You know, uh, our little nephew, he didn't know how to call Annie. He wanted, he said, Annie. Annie, Annie. Take it, take it, take it. Maybe Annie. he doesn't like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, I can start uh, feeding them. I do feed them with rice and with fish. Fish? I, yes, fish, bread, everything. The food we eat. Oh, here's the food. Yeah, here's the food now. Come here, boy. Annie. Annie, 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 what is even more astonishing is that the marine iguana would accept any food other than that which nature provides underwater. It is a breakthrough that baffles researchers. The big one doesn't want the little one to, to have food. Huh? The little one is... Ah, oh, huh? This one is jealous. The dog is jealous. Yeah, come on. Come here, 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 come no, I think not only food, I also uh, laugh to them on the mouth, I would say. And this is Annie, he's about 15 years with us now. Oh, honey boy. Yeah, enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. Here, let's go in, it's hot in here. Greeting the guest in marvelous coexistence, marine iguanas and mother-in-law at home. Let's sit down on the sofa. Here? Yeah? yeah, right over there. There's a few of them really tame. This one seems nervous. Yes, he's a bit nervous. I don't know because he. Uh, well, you know, I notice him because he has only one foot. He has only ah. three fingers. The astonishing peaceful dragon will only occasionally bite the hand that feeds him. No, don't show this. Hey, look at it. Look at this. Yeah, hey, hey, Annie. No, 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 no. Let go. He's really holding tight. Is he? And it hurts. Well, it hurt a bit, sure. 
I shall not do anything now because if I pull my hand, yes, he gets mad. Same as a dog. <laughs> Anyhow, I had to make friendship, and I made friendship with the Iguanas. And they permitted us, because I think I was nice to them, because I liked them. I maybe could also be very rude and chase them out, but I couldn't do it. And they liked me, and so we became friends. Don't you think that uh, if uh, man had always done this with wildlife, where they settled, that today, we would be in a better shape with and would the environment. Be, really, there would be a much better way of, if the man had done himself to become friendly to animals, the whole thing on this island everywhere would be different. Now that you have been living on this island, would you say that they are really a paradise island? <laughs> Look, the paradise you have to build yourself. Wherever you live, you have to make the paradise yourself. It can be anywhere. There are a lot of thorns around here. We build, I say, we make our paradise because we brought us, we are happy here. We love the place from the beginning, but the paradise, you have to make yourself. Otherwise, the island is rather rough, no? It's a rough country, you see, this is a lot of rocks, lava. It has its beauty. I would say it's a paradise for the animals, like the iguanas, the sea lions. For them, because it's their place. For them, it's their paradise. Thirty miles at sea, between the far-flung islands, we unexpectedly encounter a herd of sea lions. But they are behaving like dolphins. I have never seen anything like it. What is the reason for such a gathering? I send the divers down. Now we understand. We are the first men ever to witness the sea lion's engagement ceremony. Every year, they go en masse to sea and choose mates for the coming season. As the young bulls and sleek females court, the sensuous grace of their preliminary sexual play makes a tender ballet. Our prima ballerina in a dance of desire. A soulful gaze, an invitation to join the feast. Man and animal in harmony in the sea. In our departure from the Galapagos, we leave behind a unique world that lives in ignorance of fear. Here, there are no predators on land. The predator is an animal with weapons. No weapons, no violence, no fear. Disarmament and peace. What an irony if the peaceful marine iguana, which over millions of years has outlived other species, would also outlive man the warrior. An unacceptable thought. The gentle dragon would never take over the world. But if man would refuse to curb his self-destructive ways, this primeval being just might inherit it.
The relationship of the animals of Galapagos to their severe environment is in most delicate balance. In a marginal habitat, theirs is a tentative security. These barren islands offer their wildlife, unique and irreplaceable, a harsh paradise at best. These islands have not yet fallen to man's onslaughts on Earth. But this is a shrinking world, and human beings in their avid search for wild places have already begun to threaten these remote volcanic shores. As the poet Edna St. Vincent Millay wrote, this little life from here to there, who lives it safely anywhere? The tidal wave devours the shore. There are no islands anymore. Visitors come with innocent enthusiasm to thrill at nature. But we have divorced ourselves so much from nature, we no longer know how to handle it. For our marine iguana, the sea may be only temporary sanctuary. If man's intrusion reaches out from shore, for the durable dragon that has defied the centuries, there will be no islands anymore. <laughs> 